So it's my pleasure once again to bring out David Eagleman. Um, over the last five years, he's been the MC of this event, and he's just been an absolute joy, of, uh, just a close friend of the family. Cheryl and I have had the unique opportunity of spending a lot of time with him and talking with him about what he's going to talk about. And it will come as no surprise, he's versed in a lot of conversations and topics. I want to welcome back to the stage for his presentation, Dr. David Eagleman. Thank you, Ernie. All right. Here's what I want to talk about. In, 17, uh, in 1670, Blaise Pascal noted with awe that man is incapable of understanding the infinitely small scales from which he emerges. And we are infinitely incapable, we are, we are equally incapable of, of understanding the infinite, the, the largeness in which we're engulfed. So in other words, between atoms and galaxies, we're trapped on this little strip in between of what we can actually see. And it turns out that the intervening 350 years of science have only made that worse because what we now understand is that we're not seeing most of what's happening at our own spatial scale. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Take something like electromagnetic radiation. So this is the stuff that comes from the sun and bounces off of objects and strikes cells at the back of our eyes and allows us to see. And this is what we call visible light. And depending on the wavelength, that has different colors. And this is known as electromagnetic radiation. And that's what defines our visible world. But it turns out we're not seeing all of the EM radiation out there. We're only seeing one ten trillionth of it. So passing through your body are radio waves, and television waves, and gamma, and x-rays, and all sorts of things that are all the same stuff. It's all electromagnetic radiation, but it is completely invisible to you. So National Public Radio is passing through your body right now, and you don't know it because you don't have biological receptors for it. Now, it turns out that when you look across the animal kingdom, you do find other animals that can pick up on this. So, for example, snakes can see a little bit into the infrared range, and honeybees can see into the ultraviolet range, just a little bit on, on either side of us. And, of course, we build machines that we put in the dashboards of our cars to detect radio waves, and we build machines at hospitals to, uh, to detect x-rays. But the point is that what you can see, what you are able to experience is completely limited by your biology. You don't have specialized receptors for infrared or ultraviolet or radio or x-ray, and so try as you might, you will never be able to see that. And I think this goes against the common sense intuition that our eyes and our ears and our fingertips and our nose are just passively sensing objective reality out there, right? But it's not. It's only a very small piece of reality that we're sensing. And it's even more interesting than that, because beyond electromagnetic radiation, there's the issue that different animals are trying to pick up on different senses from their environment anyway. So, for example, if you're the, the blind tick, the signals from your ecosystem by which you get information about the world are butyric acid and body heat. That's what you're picking up on, not EM radiation. If you're the black ghost knife fish, your signals are electrical fields. You're generating and sensing electrical fields in the water. If you're the blind echolocating bat, the important signals in your ecosystem are air compression waves. And each of these animals has their own little slice of reality. And the scientific term for this is called their umwelt. Their umwelt is the little piece of the world that they can see based on the sensors that they have. And I think the really interesting part is that we all assume that the umwelt that we are seeing is the entire objective reality out there, right? Because why would any of these animals ever stop to think that there might be something more going on beyond what they can sense? And this is, of course, reminiscent of the Truman Show, where Truman is a character whose whole world is constructed on the fly around him uh, by this intrepid producer. And at some point in the movie, an interviewer asks the producer, why do you suppose it is that Truman has never come close to discovering the real nature of what's going on here? And the producer says, it's because we all accept the reality that is presented to us. And that's exactly right. So I want to give you a consciousness razor on this so I can really drive this point home to then take us to the next level. So imagine that you are a bloodhound dog. 
And your whole world is about scent. It's about smelling. So you've got this long snout with 200 million olfactory receptors in it. And you have uh, wet nostrils that attract and trap scent molecules. And you have slits in your nostrils so that you can bring in big airfuls of air. And even you have floppy ears that, that flop on the ground and kick up scent molecules so that everything in your life is about these scent molecules. It's about smelling. Now... Imagine that one day you're following your human master and you stop with a revelation and you think, my gosh, what is it like to have the pitiful little nose of a human? They must be blind. What is it like to not know that there's a cat a hundred yards away or that your friend visited the spot on the grass six hours ago? Right, but because... You're a human and you know what it's like. You don't miss those things. You've never thought about it being otherwise. That is the reality that we have and that we accept. You know, people who are colorblind, until you explain to them that there exist hues that other people can see, that's a thought that doesn't ever cross their mind. And they don't miss those colors because they've never experienced it. Now, if you have normal color vision and you're feeling pretty good about that, you should know that a fraction of the females, of human females, have not just three types of color photoreceptors in their retina, but they have four types, which means they can see colors that the rest of us can't see, which might explain some marital disputes and so on. But the issue is, if you thought that you were doing just fine with your vision, you now know that compared to these tetrachromatic females, you have an impoverishment that you weren't even aware of. But you miss those extra hues only as much as you miss the, um, you know, the scent uh, that the bloodhound dog is having, which is to say, you don't miss it at all because he didn't even know it was there. So what I want to talk about is the future of being human and specifically what are advancing technologies going to do to the human umwelt? And how will that change the experience of being human, and I'm not going to extrapolate into the future, I'm only going to talk about things that are happening right now that will change what it is to have human experience. And so what many of you may know is that there are hundreds of thousands of people walking around right now with artificial eyes and ears. And uh, essentially these are, you put a, a video camera or a microphone that digitally samples, send the information to an electrode array that talks to the optic nerve or the auditory nerve, and then people can come to hear and see. So these are a terrific example that we can marry our technology to our biology. But here's the point that I want to emphasize that I think is really interesting. Is as recently as about 20 years ago, Nobody thought this would work. I mean, scientists didn't think this would work. Now, why is that? It's because the way that cameras and microphones do digital sampling and then talking to these things, they speak a slightly different language than our natural sensory organs do. These are speaking the language of Silicon Valley rather than the sort of natural mother nature language. And so people thought, you know what? The brain's not gonna know what to do with that dialect. But what happened is the brain figured it out. And in the course of two weeks, people with artificial retinas and cochleas, although they can't see very well first and they can't hear very well, this information starts to make sense. Now that's amazing. How does that work? How could that be? Well, the answer is, the way to think about this is that all the brain ever sees are electrical signals and it has to figure out what to do with it. So the brain is locked in silence and darkness in the vault of your skull. And all that it ever experiences are these electrical signals moving around on these brain cells called neurons. It doesn't see and hear. All it experiences is, is this. Data coming in along these data fiber cables that we call the optic nerve or the auditory nerve. The key is that the brain is so flexible and intelligent that what it's really good at doing is taking in these incoming streams of information and figuring out how to make sense out of them and figuring out how to have direct perceptual experience about these things. And the brain is so flexible at doing this that in my next book, I'm proposing that Mother Nature's great secret is that all she has to do is design the brain once and then she can drop into any animal, into any body plan, and the brain will figure out what it needs to do. And I'm calling this the MPH model of evolution. And I don't want to get too technical here, but MPH stands for Mr. Potato Head. And what I mean by this 
What I mean is, all these sensors that we know and love, like your eyes and ears and nose and fingertips and so on, these are just peripheral plug and play devices. Your brain doesn't care what these things are. You can plug in anything you want, and the brain figures out what to do with that incoming stream of information. And then you look across the animal kingdom, you find all kinds of very weird and interesting plug and play devices. So for example, uh, snakes have heat pits. That's how they're able to see in infrared. Brain just figures out what to do with that. Um, the, the ghost fish that I mentioned generates and receives electrical fields. Brain figures out what to do with it. This is the star-nosed mole, which is a blind animal that burrows underground and its nose is essentially 20 fingers that feels around in the dark. That's a really weird nose, right? But the brain just, you plug it right in and it figures out what to do with it. And it figures out how to see, how to move around in the dark. And of course, we now know that birds and cows and whales, they all have magnetite. They are orienting to the magnetic field of the planet. And this is just part of their umwelt and part of what they can do. It's just a plug and play peripheral sensor and their brain figures out what to do with it. So what this means is the particular sensory devices that you have come to be very used to, there's nothing really fundamentally special about them. They constrain how you're able to experience reality. They are what shape and define your reality. But these are just things that we have inherited on a complex road of evolutionary history. But there's nothing sort of fundamental about these, these external sensors. And I think our best proof for that is an area called sensory substitution. And sensory substitution refers to this idea of feeding in sensory information into the brain through unusual sensory channels. And the miracle is that the brain just figures it out. Now this isn't something sort of speculative or new. First example of this was in the journal Nature in 1969. So there's a scientist named Paul Bakke Rita and he hooked up a video camera and the feed from that video camera went to a dental chair and a bunch of solenoids in the back of the dental chair. So you sit in the chair and whatever you put in front of the camera gets poked into your back. So if you put a, a face in front of the camera, then you feel a certain pattern of poking in your back. And he sat blind people down in this chair. And what he found is that within a week, they were coming to have visual experience. They could tell not only what was there, in front of the camera, it's a circle, a square, a face, this moving object, but they were starting to feel as though they were seeing it. Now that sounds bizarre, of course, but just remember that all vision ever is, is electrical signals getting to the brain that have a certain structure. And there have been many incarnations of sensory substitution since this time. So this is the sonic glasses, which takes a video feed and converts it to auditory sound. So as you walk around, you hear and, and it sounds like a cacophony at first and you bump into things and hit your shin, but after two weeks, you're seeing. You're having visual experience and you can walk around with these things. Another version of this puts uh, electro-tactile uh, little prickly signals on your forehead. You come to see through the skin of your forehead. And the most recent incarnation is called the brain port, where you take this little electrical grid and stick it on your tongue, because that's a good conducive environment. You can have high resolution there. And people can see with the brain port. The video feed is getting fed into their tongue. They are seeing through their tongue. They can throw a ball into a basket across the room. It's incredible. All of this shows that sensory substitution is a really great way to circumvent a broken sensory system. And so one of the, one, and, and what this does is it, it is the proof of principle of the MPH model, the Mr. Potato Head model, which is to say, it doesn't matter how you get the information there, as long as you're getting it there. So one of the projects we're doing in my lab right now is working on how to build sensory substitution to solve deafness. And I want to introduce for that my graduate student, Scott Novich, who is spearheading this work for his thesis project. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Oh, that was awesome. All right, cool. So uh, this application that David's running on his laptop behind me illustrates how we envision our sound-to-touch sensory substitution system to work. So sound from the environment is taken into this device. The quick brown fox. And in real time, that information is compressed and then mapped to some sort of wearable device, such as a vest, 
And this vest contains some sort of array of uh, tactile interfaces, like little vibratory motors or electro-tactile stimulators, represented here by these uh, big black boxes that light up when they're being stimulated. Jumped over the lazy dog. So we started working on this uh, a good number of months ago, developing all sorts of custom electronics. And then we had this an epiphany that, wait a second, everything we pretty much need to create this project is right here in our pockets. So as it turns out, I actually have a uh, working demo of this. Um, and let's see. <laughs> Not only that, but in real time, um, I can talk into my phone, the quick brown fox, and, I'm, and, oh, <laughs> yes. and uh, this information is compressed and transmitted wirelessly over Bluetooth to the vest that David is wearing. Great. And what we're going to be doing is testing this on deaf participants in the coming months. And the idea is that uh, at first it just feels like a bunch of vibratory patterns as Scott is speaking into the phone. Uh, it just feels like random patterns, but the idea is that after a couple of weeks of wearing this, people will begin to have direct perceptual experience of hearing. In the same way that a blind person who's passing his finger over Braille doesn't think of it as, okay, bump, 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 but thinks of it as reading letters and words. And if this, assuming this technology works for deaf people, it's going to be a game changer, and here's why. It's because cochlear implants require an invasive surgery, and they're 50,000 bucks. This can be made for $500, and it can be worn under the clothing, and there's no invasive surgery involved. So we're very excited about this project. Thank you. We're very excited about this project. In the context of today's talk, though, about the human umwelt, what we wanted to explore is this idea of how can you use something like this to expand what it means to be a human? So just as an example, let's say instead of feeding in auditory patterns, we stream real-time data from the internet that carries, let's say, weather patterns from the surrounding 200 miles. So while I'm standing right here, I'm feeling on my skin all day uh, what's happening in the weather of the region. The idea is that I would come to have a direct perceptual experience at a scale that's very different than what a human can normally experience, to be tapped into what's going on 200 miles around me. And here's another example that Scott and I have been working on, which is what would it be like to actually have a direct perceptual experience of the stock market? What if you fed real-time data from the net into your skin all day? Now here's the key. You don't consciously need to pay attention to the vibrations to learn this stuff, just in the same way that to learn a language as a child, you don't need to consciously practice vocabulary words. You're just getting the information coming into the brain all day long. So imagine I'm unconsciously doing this and I'm watching, you know, the news and if people are happy and whatever, that expands my human umwelt so I'm tapped into the economy of the planet, the complex movements of the world. So that's something that we're working on now. And the question is, would I have a direct perceptual experience of when to buy and when to sell? Um, and here's another thing we've been working on. So we've all heard of the Spidey Sense, Peter Parker's Spidey Sense. We want to build the Tweety Sense. So just imagine that all day long, while everybody was tweeting with the Up Experience hashtag, we were tracking all of those tweets. And imagine that as I'm walking around all day long, I'm plugged into the sentiment of 850 people. And I can tell what's going on and how the room is feeling in real time. That's an experience that's larger than the normal human umwelt. You don't normally get to be tapped into the sentiment of 850 people. And I think the big expanded version of this is plug into the whole planet, because we all know that Twitter is the consciousness of the planet in terms of, you know, ideas can trend above the noise floor and rise to the top, just like thoughts do in your brain. And um, so what if you took 500,000 tweets per second and passed those through natural language processing and fed them into the vest so that all day long as you're walking around, you are tapped into the entire planet. You realize, oh, something weird just happened in Saudi Arabia or, oh, the government shut down again or whatever it is. You would, feel, you would be plugged into the, you would be more worldly in a sensory sense. So thank you, Scott, for joining me on stage here. Thanks. So if I get my slides back, 
<clears throat> so, so sensory substitution uh, for the deaf is what we're working on right now and expanding the umwelt. But it turns out that this idea is something that's already happening all over the planet, this idea of expanding our slice of reality. So about a thousand people already have have been implanting little neodymium magnets in their fingertips so that they can feel electromagnetic radiation. So you go up to the transformer on your laptop and you can feel the bubble of EM radiation around it. It has a form and a shape. And uh, people who have these implants say that the frequency gives it a, a color as well. And so if you get these little implants in your fingers, you can fix your electronics and figure out what's going on without b breaking out the voltameter because you can feel where the current is going. It expands the human umbelt in a very simple way. Um, people are doing this in many ways. On, on the left here is a man named Neil Harbison who is colorblind. So he hooked up what he calls the iBorg, which is just a little camera that takes color information and converts it into sound. So he walks around and he hears the color on everything. And that's how he's able to expand his umbelt. This is his girlfriend, Moon, who uh, has implanted in her ears uh, what she calls the speed board. It's motion detectors, and she stands in the middle of crowds, and she feels the motion and the sway of crowds. And the fact is, from a theoretical point of view, there's really no limit to what we can envision in terms of sensory receptors that you could plug in and the brain would figure out. Think of expansions like, you know, infrared vision and ultraviolet vision or 360 degree vision. Some people are hooking up ultrasonic range finders so they can feel behind them when somebody's approaching behind them, right? And beyond sensory expansion like that, you can imagine no limit to sensory addition like weather or stock market or Twitter. And so the bottom line is that the human umwelt is on the move and we're increasingly in a position now where we can choose our own peripheral sensors and expand the slice of reality that we are able to see. And in this sense, I think we're no longer a natural species in the sense that we don't have to wait for mother nature's sensory gifts on her time scale, but instead, we can make our own. And like any good parent, what she has given us is the cognitive tools to go out and to create our own reality. So thanks very much for your attention.